Friends, in Jesus of Nazareth, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Thanks be to God. May the Lord be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship on this, the Lord's Day. We're glad that you're worshiping here with us today and, and hope you'll return often to worship and serve with us. Several announcements this morning, some important announcements. First, you may have noticed a different face on the screen playing the organ this morning. Mary Lynn Darden is filling in this morning because Matt McMahon and Lori are in New Hampshire for the wedding of their son, Wesley. So we're thrilled for uh, Wesley and, and his bride and, and for Matt and Lori. But um, Mary Lynn Darden is doing a wonderful job filling in today, and thank you to Mary Lynn. And Ron Warren is directing the choir, so thank you to Ron for directing. This Saturday, we have the annual Blessing of the Pets. This is a really fun occasion. If you have a pet at home, bring your pet on Saturday, as long as it doesn't bite. And we will be glad to uh, have a blessing with your pet. It's a fun event here on the Terrace Garden Saturday morning. We'd love to see you here. Uh, we always have a lot of folks from the community come. It's a great outreach event, so we look forward to that. This Tuesday, we need some of you to show up for our interns. Uh, Amazing Grace Ayibahu from Lagos, Nigeria, is in her third year of seminary, fourth year of seminary. And Nicole, uh, uh, many of you got to know Nicole over the last year. She is Nicole Jiskut. They need folks on their ministry teams to walk with them, to meet with them a couple of times this semester, next semester, uh, to encourage them, to give feedback to their leadership, to reflect with them on the life of the church. We're going to have a training Tuesday night. Please come. We need you. It doesn't matter if you're a member yet or not. It doesn't matter if you've ever done this before. Uh, we need folks in the pews to sit with our interns and help them along the way. On Friday night, the 27th, we're having trunk and treat, which is a uh, takeoff on trick or treat. We have trunks decorated in the parking lot. You're welcome to decorate your trunk, bring candy for the kids. It's a fun event. Again, many, many members of the community and from our preschool families will be there. It's a great time. Uh, we invite you to come with kids or to come with a trunk and participate. On the 29th, which is two weeks from today, we have our Kirkin of the Tartan. We'll have our, a lot of the Scottish Heritage banners. We'll have the bagpipes. We'll have Commitment Sunday. It's going to be a, a grand celebration of some of the history of the church and also the future of the church. Today, after worship, our folks from our stewardship team and our finance team are going to be in the parlor. They're there to uh, address any questions about the budget or about pledging to give some information about that. We're calling it soft drinks and hard numbers. They've got some uh, soft drinks to share. So if you're interested in the, the financial side of the church, what's happening, where's the money go, where's it come from, come to the parlor just after worship. It's good to have Natalie Boosted back in church. Natalie had a little stay in the hospital Oh, and then with her brother, we're so glad you're here and glad you're better. Catherine Carter, who had a fall recently is, and had a surgery, is uh, with her son in Macon. And uh, she has improving. She's doing well. And we we're, look forward to her being back soon. In your bulletin, there's other information about Christmas wreaths to buy from the choir, about Angel Tree coming up soon, about... Uh, fun, fun run for Decatur Cooperative Ministry that's coming up in a couple of weeks about providing meals for campus ministry for college students. Please read through your bulletin and note those announcements. And finally, a special welcome to families, to the children who are receiving Bibles today. We're so glad you're here and look forward to that later in the service. Now, let us stand and call ourselves, be called to worship. God, you are my shepherd. I don't need a thing. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Your trusty shepherd's crook makes me feel secure. Your beauty and love chase after me every day of my life.
Let us pray. God, our helper, you are strength greater than the mountains. You look to our needs and watch over us day and night. Teach us to hold confidently to your grace that in times of fear and danger, we may know that you are near and depend on, on you, our sure deliverer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We are ever in need of God's grace for our, from our first days to our last. Jesus knows our every weakness and loves us still. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Let us confess our sins to God by using the prayer printed in the bulletin. Holy and merciful God, in your presence we confess our sinfulness, our shortcomings, our offenses against you. You alone know often we have sinned in ignoring your invitation, wandering from your ways, wasting your gifts, and forgetting your love. Continue together. Have mercy on us, O Lord, for we are ashamed and sorry for all we have done to displace you. Forgive our sins and help us to live in your light. Walk in your way and enter the plentiful of that you stand before us for the sake of Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I declare unto you in the name of Jesus Christ that we are all forgiven. As we are going to sh to exchange the peace of the Lord with one another. I want you to do that in confidence and in assurance that we are forgiven. You should look at your neighbor's face, introduce yourself, and pass the peace of the Lord unto them. Peace be unto you.
You may be seated. As Todd mentioned, this is a special Sunday, so I would like to invite all the children in the church to come forward. And if you are receiving a Bible today, I want you to sit on this front row back there. Ward, go sit back there with Evie. Eleanor, go back that way. You, you two too, right there, that front row. These are my shoes. Those are glorious shoes. I love that. But mine are better. Oh, okay, yours are better. Well, you know, we can all have great shoes. All right, come on down, come on down, come on down. And if there's no more room, you can just have a seat right there in the front. Perfect, perfect. So I have something special to share with you. Well, first of all, I want the church to see that there are so many kids up here and I'm just so excited. (laughs) It is just so good to see you all, all of your beautiful smiley faces. So this church believes really strongly that every person, no matter how old or young you might be, that you have a Bible, a Bible that you can read. So whether it has pictures or whether it has words, this church feels it is really important that you have a Bible. And so today, we are giving our preschoolers and our kindergartners a picture Bible And our third graders are getting the common English translation of the Bible with lots of devotions and things just for them in the Bible. Friends, your church gives you Bibles because we love you. We love you a whole lot. You are five. (laughs) And we want to honor the promise that we made to you when you were born and when you were baptized that we would share God's special word with you all of your life. We pray for you. We pray that God will guide you and your family and all of us with these Bibles that we will use at home, that you will use when you go to Sunday school or when you go to chapel or when you come here to worship. We are all going to learn together and we're going to grow in our love for God and God's word all of our days. These Bibles are full of special stories, special stories of people, people who are children of God, just like you. There was a man named Abraham. Maybe you've heard of him. Abraham followed God's calling to go to a new land, and he did exactly what God asked him to do, and God blessed him. There was a lady named Rahab, and she hid spies when they came into Jericho, and she helped them escape and kept them safe. And in this way, she helped God's people and she became one of them. David was chosen as a young boy to be the king of Israel. He trusted God as he fought Goliath, as he won wars against the Philistines, and he brought the ark back to Jerusalem. David was a man after God's own heart. Esther saved the people of God when Haram tried to kill all of them. She used her role as the queen to be a voice for people who did not have a voice. And we also remember that God came to be one of us, to be with us in Jesus. He was born in a stable in Bethlehem. And Jesus came so that we might have life. So as you read the stories in your Bibles, the story of children long ago, we hope that you will see that God can use you too. That you can share God's love wherever you go. We hope that you find courage to be brave, We hope that you feel comforted when you're scared or you're sad. And we hope that you learn how to praise God when you are so thankful for all the good things in your life. These Bibles are for you. They are yours. They have your name inside of them. So go to them often. Read them. Look at the pictures. Share them with younger brothers or sisters. And know that God is speaking to you today and every day. Will you all say a prayer with me? Thank you, God, for your word, for the stories about your people from long ago, and for the stories about how you came to be with us. Help us to read your word, to open our ears so that we may hear what you are saying, open our eyes so that we may see your work in the world, and open our hearts so that we may live as a part of your continuing story. Amen. Now, friends who are receiving a Bible, Are you listening? I'm going to call your name, and when I do, I want you to come forward and stand right up here next to me. Can you do that? Yeah. Yeah. Liesl. Come on up, Liesl. 
or just sit right where you are. That also works too. You get your Bible regardless of whether you come stand up here or not. Oh, some people aren't here. Anne. Nora. I'll come to you. I got two feet. <laughs> Ward. Evie. Harper. Leo, Charlie, there you are, this Charlie, you're coming next, other Charlie, Eleanor, get me who will need to, there you go, it's kind of heavy, there's a lot of stories in there, Charlie McHugh, Brayden, and Lucas. So friends, we hope that you will continue to use these Bibles and learn what it means to be a child of God. And now, church, I invite you to say with me the blessing printed in your bulletin. Receive the word of God. Learn its stories and study its words. Its stories belong to us all, and these words speak to us all. They tell us who we are. They tell us that we belong to one another for we are the people of God. And now we go our separate ways. May God be with you here. Before turning to hear God's word and Holy Scripture, let us turn to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, by the power of your Holy Spirit, illuminate your word this day, that it may not return empty, but accomplish all you intend. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the ancient Near East village, a wedding celebration was a big deal for the entire community. Everyone in the village would know about the wedding and would greatly anticipate the celebration which could last for days. A grand wedding feast would become a public occasion for the whole neighborhood. In our parable today, inexplicably, inexplicably some of the villagers made light of the invitation. They chose not to come to the wedding. Some even mistreated and killed the servants when they showed up to tell them that the feast had been prepared. Another friend 
showed up for the wedding feast, but did not show up prepared. He made light of the event itself, made light of his host by not dressing appropriately. This parable that comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable is situated in the Gospel of Matthew not long after Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. The whole city was in turmoil as the Passover approached. The streets were as crowded as the streets of Athens, Georgia on game day. Jesus had gone to the Temple Mount to drive out all those buying and selling in the temple courtyard and the tension between Jesus and the chief priests and the elders was growing. The unsettled crowds of the city are regarding Jesus as a prophet who's come to the temple and they gather around him in droves to hear the next story that he will tell. Today's verses represent the third parable of judgment against the religious elite of the day. Now, in this parable, before we read it, Jesus is referring here to the celebration of the great messianic banquet to be experienced in the presence of God and all God's people. Unlike John the Baptist, who lived out in the wilderness and spoke of impending doom with the coming kingdom, Jesus lived among the people. He shared their daily life. He shared their seasonal celebrations. Jesus came eating and drinking, as the Gospels report, and referring time and again to this prophetic vision of the messianic banquet which had arrived with his presence. Matthew warns the religious elite, the religious insiders, to stop making excuses for not participating in what God is doing. In Matthew, the insiders are failing to set aside all their obligations and duties and and laws, their concerns, in order to celebrate, for heaven's sake, with the king's son who has come. The great wedding celebration of the groom, which is Christ, and the bride, which is to be the church. Hear the word of God from Matthew 22, verses 1 to 14. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again, he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroying those murderers, and burned their cities. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets and invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. The servants went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both good and bad, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The word of the Lord. Some interesting questions that come up in these parables, and many of you this week have studied that with uh, Vernon and Faith in Real Life or with the Wednesday night group last week. Before we address some of those questions, let's talk about the wedding invitation. Now, many of you know this, that, that... you're aware that an invitation to a party, whether to a wedding or some other event, whether it's online or printed, can communicate volumes to those who have understanding. When you understand how to read an invitation, you, you get certain things. Now, my wife will tell you that, that, that yes, the time and the place will be on there and, and that some of the basic details, but there's a whole lot more that's communicated in that invitation than just what's printed on the page. People like me may notice the basic details. Location, 
time, you know. But other people will notice things like the paper it's printed on and the font of the writing and the artwork or color that's on the invitation. And all of those things communicate volumes to those who have understanding. Based on the invitation, if it's done well, a trained guest will know not only when to show up, and, but also what to wear, and if they're supposed to bring a gift, and who else is going to be there, and how long it'll last, and whether or not you can bring a significant other. One of the great travesties in life is when someone receives an invitation to a joyous event and makes light of it, doesn't show up. Or they may show up in person, but they don't really show up fully, if you know what I mean. You know what I'm talking about. You may know someone who is physically present at a party, but refuses to dance when everyone else at the wedding is dancing. Or you may know someone who refuses to sing when everyone else in the room is singing. Now granted, that person may be uncomfortable, they may feel awkward, they may not trust their voice or their body, but so often they're missing out on the joy. No matter how hard you might try to encourage them, they seem determined not to join in and and have fun. Now they might have other ways of having fun, but at least on the surface of things, they seem determined not to enjoy the grace of living. William Perkey began his career as a public school teacher. He had a passion for teaching students and he had a passion for, 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 his, what he do, for writing about leadership. He became a tenured professor at the University of Florida. He wrote a lot of books on leadership. And there's a popular quote that's been attributed to William Perkey. You gotta dance like nobody's watching. Love like you've never been hurt. Sing like nobody's listening and live like it's heaven on earth. What Jesus was saying in this parable is that his presence, his incarnation, his arrival as the promised Messiah was and is an occasion for celebration, for joyful song and dance. This is the time he was proclaiming to to live like it's heaven on earth. When Jesus spoke of the kingdom of God, he said the kingdom is like a fantastic wedding feast. He said that the coming kingdom is like a king throwing a joyful banquet for his beloved son and his bride, which will be the church. And all people are welcome to gather at the table in God's presence at peace and well fed. This weekend, Melanie's brother and his daughter, our niece, have been in town, along with our niece's husband and their four-month-old baby, Mara. Several years ago, I had the good privilege of officiating at our niece's wedding in Indianapolis. Last night, Melanie's sister was hosting a dinner for uh, the family, and we wouldn't have missed this for the world. We got the invitation, and we didn't make light of it. We weren't going to sit at home and do house projects. We were going to be there to to catch up with our family members and to to see little baby Mara. We were going to be there to spend some time with them. And last night after dinner, I got to hold that precious four-month-old, and she fell asleep in my arms and had a little taste of the kingdom of heaven. This violence in Israel and Gaza. It's not what God intends for humankind. God intends for all of God's children to be at peace. To sit at table together. To hold crying babies until they fall asleep. To rejoice in the wonder and beauty of creation, not the devastation of bombs. To celebrate the birth of their children, to experience the wonder of time spent with those who live far away. 
when innocents are mistreated, when human beings are caged, when children are killed, the cycles of violence continue. Matthew's parable includes the sending, the enraged king sending the servants into the city to burn the city and destroy the murderers. Most likely referring to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD when the Roman army comes in and destroys the temple. About 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion. That violence in Israel has been going on a long time. But the book of Acts and the early church proclaimed that no matter the response of those who took the invitation lightly, the banquet hall, the wedding feast, will ultimately be filled. When those who received the invitation did not come, the king will send his servants out into the lanes and the streets and throughout the world to invite all whom they meet. It doesn't matter if they are lame or blind or disabled, if they're homeless or poor or from a different race or different country or even different religion. What matters is that there are seats in the banquet hall to be filled. There's a grand feast to be shared. There's a king to be honored and a son and a bride to celebrate. And then we have this... A strange ending to the parable. Appended to this story of this great inclusion of outsiders in the messianic feast when the religious elite have making lie to the invitation, Matthew offers from the mouth of Jesus this parable of harsh exclusion of this one friend who shows up without the wedding robe. I wish that part of the parable wasn't in there. To be honest, it's one of those scriptures that I do not like very much. Especially since that addended parable has been greatly misused over the years to make people feel unwelcome or less than in worship services. Scholars will argue that it was added later, that maybe Jesus offered this parable in a different context. Nevertheless, here it is in the Gospel of Matthew, appended to this parable, and so we've got to deal with it. The wedding banquet of the king's son and is an event of tremendous hospitality. Such an event was an important celebration for the entire community, the entire village. Everyone would have planned their attendance. They would have planned their attire for weeks or months in advance. They would have cleaned themselves up as much as possible where they would have come dressed to the nine. Reminds me of the children in Nicaragua when we would go to worship on Sundays in the, in the little village. Many in the village of Los Robles live in small huts. They have dirt floors. They're, some of their lights are, are Pepsi bottles that are, um, that are sunlights into their rooms because they don't have electricity. They don't have closets or electric irons or clothes washers. But when those children show up for worship, they're smiling They're clean, their hair is combed, their white shirts are pressed and clean. They appear before God and their neighbors looking as best they can. They have a little sense of reverence and they take personal pride in being prepared and ready for worship. In Matthew's parable, this guest who shows up without a wedding robe... We don't know why. We don't know why he's not dressed as the others. We do, know what, do not know if he could not have afforded the robe. We, we do not know if he refused to wear the wedding garments that were, may have been handed out at the door. All we know is that this grand celebration, this feast is happening, and this one appears unprepared and disrespectful. When asked by the king, he gives no excuse. He remains silent. In the Bible, and biblical references, clothes are often a symbol of one's character. Does this man have no sense of propriety? Was he neglectful of even the basic courtesy? It seems so unlike the welcoming Jesus to have this man tossed out because he's not wearing a wedding robe. 
Others made light of the invitation and didn't show up. This man was physically present, but not thoughtful or sincere or fully participating. And in doing so, he made light of the feast and even the king himself. I was trying to understand this, and and the only thing I could get my head around was imagining if a groom showed up to his wedding unprepared. For example, imagine a groom showing up to his wedding in his yard clothes. He might say, here I am. I I got the grass cut. Didn't have time for a shower. How do you think his bride would feel about that? She'd be feel unloved. She'd feel dishonored. Her father would be disrespected. What if the bride showed up in her gym clothes? Got my workout in. No time for makeup or hair. Forgot my wedding dress unthinkable right we dress in a certain way we show up at a certain time we prepare our hearts and minds because we love and honor and respect the event and the host we don't know whether the man with the robe thought too much of himself or thought too less of himself but he appeared without reverence without respect And as a result, he was tossed into the alleyway where there was no light and no longer the privilege of being in the presence of the king. It's a parable of judgment on the religious insiders, the religious elite of Israel. And it can be unsettling because it challenges us to locate ourselves in the parable. Are we those who make light of the invitation? Are we those who show up and not fully prepared to participate? Or maybe we're those who are out in the streets who got invited in at the last minute to fill a seat. One thing that I always try to remember is that Jesus... Was not a gloomy person. Jesus didn't show up preaching doom like John the Baptist. One of my favorite renderings of Jesus sitting on a shelf in my office is of Jesus standing on a fishing boat holding on to the, some of the ropes and he's smiling and laughing with his disciples. When I think of Jesus in Galilee, I imagine Jesus there on a fishing boat Smiling and laughing with his disciples, I imagine him cooking breakfast on the beach over an open fire for Peter. Imagine him hiking to the top of Mount Arbel, which has a glorious view of the Sea of Galilee. I imagine Jesus at that wedding in Cana of Galilee with his disciples and his cousins and aunts and uncles. Jesus came to usher in the kingdom of God, a a kingdom of a messianic banquet, a feast of joy, of singing and dancing and happiness. Someone once said that an unhappy Christian is a contradiction in terms. To be a Christian, to follow Jesus, is to know his joy, to feel his love, to know the wonder of his creation and to be at peace with all of our siblings. Friends, God has invited us to that glorious feast. Let us not make light of the invitation. Amen. Friends, having heard the word proclaimed, please stand and join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. 
From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, the Lord hears our prayers as we offer them, and God responds in God's way and God's time. Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes no, sometimes wait. So today, let us offer our prayers to God, and I ask you today, for whom and for what would you like to pray today? Prayers of joy, prayers of concern. For whom and for what shall we pray? Gracious God, we remember your beloved child and saint of the church, Catherine Carter, today. We pray for her recovery from surgery. We pray that she may regain her strength and get back to her many areas of avenues of service which she enjoys so much. Lord, we give you thanks for Catherine and pray for her well-being today. Gracious God, we know that your heart is the first to break. When bombs fall, when hostages are taken, when innocents are killed. Lord, we pray for peace in Jerusalem, peace in Israel, peace in the Gaza Strip, peace in the West Bank. Peace in every corner of the world where there is violent bloodshed. Lord, violence is not your intention for humankind. But peace and joy and reconciliation are your good intentions. Lord, we cannot see through this, the end of this current conflict. We do not yet know how many lives will be lost. But Lord, we pray for your spirit to be at work. We pray for some new, fresh thing to come out of this terrible situation. We pray for you to work in this for good, to bring hope for the future, for the children of Gaza and the children of Israel. Lord, you are able to accomplish all far, abundantly far more than we can ask or even imagine. So, Lord, work in that place of fearfulness and anxiety and anger and frustration. And somehow, by your grace, bring a new season of peace in the months and years to come. Gracious God, the war still rages in Ukraine. Young men and women are on the front lines. The supplies are waning. We pray for soldiers on the both sides of the battle line. We pray for all those who have lost loved ones, all those who are uncertain what the next um, shower of bullets or, or missiles may bring. Well, we pray for peace in Ukraine. We pray for the leaders in Russia and Ukraine and the rest of the world to help bring peace. Lord, we pray for all those who find their nation at war. Gracious God, we pray for the children that they are cared for and safe. That they are not mistreated in any way. We pray for the children at risk throughout the world. Lord, we pray for these children who receive the Bibles today. May they read these stories with joy and anticipation. May they be allowed to ask hard and difficult questions. May you give their parents a sense of patience and determination in helping teach the stories of Jesus and bring them up in the knowledge and love of God. Lord, we're grateful for these children who are here today and for uh, your word, which will comfort them at times and challenge them at times and help them to know you better and love you more fully. Lord, hear all the prayers we offer today, those, those spoken, those unspoken, the concerns that weigh heavy on our hearts, the joys that we can't help but share with you and others. And Lord, hear us as we pray the prayer which our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, it is always a delight to be in worship together. Whether you are here in person or joining us online, we are so glad that you listened to the Spirit who woke you up this morning and guided you to this place. If you are here with us in person, we'd invite you to sign the gray friendship pads located at one end of the pew and pass them down to get to know those around you. There is an electronic friendship pad online, so click the link and let us know if you are joining us from home. And a special encouragement to you today, as you see the children today, whether they received their Bibles or were, are simply present here in this space, I encourage you to introduce yourself to them. Let them know who their church family is and maybe even share what your favorite Bible story is and encourage them to find that in their new Bibles today. Ooh, Good morning, and welcome all aboard the stewardship to lead in love. <laughs> Drew almost sure bet me $20 I wouldn't follow through on that. <laughs> so for those for whom I'm not a familiar face, I'm Michelle Jones, a member of the DPC Stewardship Committee and also of the incoming DPC class, Elder Class of 2026. So you may have more foghorn noises. You'll probably see my face around a little bit. <laughs> I do have a few stewardship announcements to share this morning. First, for those who have not yet heard, it is stewardship campaign season, and our theme this year is lead in love. As we were contemplating our church community ahead of this stewardship campaign, it was very clear to all of us just how full of love DPC is, God's love, our love for one another, our love for the communities that we serve. And also it was clear to us how important it is to be able to continue to finance this service in love, to lead in love. We have a couple of important upcoming dates in our stewardship campaign. One is today. Um, if you have questions about the stewardship ministry, about the church budget, uh, anything, we'll try to answer them, and we would love uh, for you to join us in the parlor directly after worship for soft drinks and hard questions. As well, Commitment Sunday is in two weeks' time on October 29th, also on Kirken of the Tartan Sunday, and we would love to see you there. As we move into the offering, I want to make sure you're aware of the various ways to give here at DPC. You can give your offering in the plate physically as it passes. There is also a QR code on the back of your bulletin and on the pledge cards either in the narthex or in the other exits as you pass through. Thank you all for your generosity and thank each of you for everything you do on behalf of the ministry of Decatur Presbyterian Church. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Let us pray. O oh God, with faith and hope, we offer these gifts to you. Use them as you use us to accomplish your purposes in Jesus Christ, the head of the church and the Lord of our lives. Amen. Again, if you are visiting with us today, we hope you return often to worship with us. And again, if you would like to um, talk to our folks from the stewardship team about the church budget or pledging, or if you'd just like to support them in what they're trying to do, come to the parlor and have a soft drink with them. Friends, go in peace, supported by the power and presence of God's Holy Spirit. Because of God's great mercy to all of us, I appeal to you to offer yourselves as living sacrifices to God. Dedicated and pleasing to God's will. Be patient in tribulation. Let your hope keep you joyful. Pray at all times. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And as you go, know that the strong and sure love of God, the amazing grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the strengthening and comforting presence of the Holy Spirit will be with you always. Mm -hmm. 